up, everybody? Y'all are excited enough. Hey, uh, turn with me to Ephesians 2 while I get set up here. Ephesians chapter 2, where we're going to start out. Everybody got their Bibles? So, uh, got some feedback here. Am I standing in the wrong place? Ephesians chapter 2, everybody. So, uh, please get your Bibles out. I don't have stuff on the screen. So you're just going to have to do it old-fashioned and read with me. Because you don't know if I'm going to get up here and say a bunch of false teaching. Um, I have, if I look back at all the times that I've done a lesson or uh, done like a sermon like this, and those of you who are like older in the faith will understand that um, your understanding when you were younger is way different than your understanding now. You might have said some things that were not quite true. So that's why we got to check each other. So uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, so I really want to talk to you about something that's been on my heart for a couple months. And uh, the subject is the gospel, right? That novel, the gospel. That's something that is, uh, Paul says is of first importance. Um, that means it's the most important thing. It's the main message. And so it's something that not only if you are somebody who doesn't know Jesus, you need to know the gospel, but it's for those of us who have been in Christ, we have to be reminded of the gospel. Because it's the gospel that's the power of God for salvation. And for those of us who are in Christ, you know, it's what motivates us. It's what propels us. We've got to be reminded of it. But the topic today, I have two points, right? Just two points. And the first point, we'll talk about the unworthiness of man. That we are unworthy. And that God is worthy. That Jesus Christ is worthy. So, uh, everybody's there in Ephesians chapter 2. I want to get started here. I usually have a reader, but I didn't want to get too complicated. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 says, And you were dead in the trespasses, which is sins. You trespass. Anybody ever trespassed before? Jacob, you trespassed before, man? You know? Maybe he has. That means you, that means you went where you weren't supposed to go, right? So you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So I love this passage, and it kind of sums up the unworthiness of man in one place. One thing that I noticed in our culture is that uh, we're really big on self-esteem and really big on, you know, believing yourself. You know, you, our, our society literally teaches that you have the power within you to get through life, to be acceptable before whatever creator you believe in, and to go about your business. But the gospel, what the Bible is teaching here is that, it's telling these followers of Jesus that before you had Christ, you were dead in, dead in your sins. What can a dead person do? Nothing, right? Dead people can't do anything. And he says that not only, and here's another thing. Today, sometimes when we talk about sin or our, our life without God, and this is just at large in the world, um, we talk about ourselves like we're victims. I'm a victim of sin. I'm a victim of what the devil's going to be. But here he says, you once walked this way, and you were following the course of this world. You were following Satan, and, and that evil spirit is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So he's saying that apart from Christ, we're not just a victim, but we're a perpetrator because we're carrying out the desires of our body and mind. I'm not just a victim that I'm actively, you know, I see that thing and I want it, so I'm going to steal it. I'm contemplating, you know, lusting after somebody else's spouse. Right? These are, this is what's going on in our mind, and our sinful nature is causing us to follow after Satan, and we're, we're actively working for him. And so it's not just a passive act, right? We're actively in sin, we're, we're actually dead. 
And this is like, this is a big deal. This is like part one of the gospel. Often, a lot of times, we skip to the happy part, which is Jesus loves you, and he's going to do all these things for you. But we miss the part that without Christ, I'm completely immobile. Therefore, we don't appreciate enough what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. And so I want to look at this a little bit more in depth. Go to Isaiah chapter 59 with me. I love this passage because it sums up the sinfulness of man. Even saying sin in our culture is like taboo. You know what I'm saying? It can't be sin. It's like, oh, this is my struggle. This is my hurts or hangups or this is kind of a bad habit. But if you say sin, people look at you kind of funny. It's kind of a Bible word. And, and sin is kind of like a, the, the, the word has a lot of weight to it. So we're going we're gonna to go through this uh, passage. So please, if you have a Bible or have it on your phone, please follow along with me because there's a lot of good meat here. Um, this, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus came to earth. It's an amazing prophecy. So the Bible says in verse 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. So he's basically saying it's not God's problem. It's not God that doesn't have the connectivity. It's your phone that doesn't have service, right? And then he says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So basically he's saying that because of my sin, right, without God, that by default, all of us, because of what we do, because of our evil thoughts, because we're actively following Satan, that all we do is really living for ourselves, that when I wake up in the morning, I don't really think about what God has for me to do, or living for Christ, that I'm just trying to fulfill my own desires and get what I need. And we see that played out in our own lives and in the world. Because of that, because God is a just judge, He can't look upon our sin and be in a relationship with us. So there's this wall of sin that's between us and God, that separates us from God. And so step one is understanding that without Christ, without being in a covenant relationship with Him, because of my sin, I'm completely separated. And then let's go on and see what he says throughout the rest of the chapter. Verse 3 says, For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoke, spoken lies, and your tongue mutters wickedness. So what I did was like I was reading through this, and I'm like, let me, let me relate this to my life. Have I seen in my life where this has been played out? What hit me was it said, your lips have spoken lies. How many of us have lied before or deceived somebody, right? I don't want somebody to deceive me the way I really am, so I'm going to misuse this information about me so that they have a pretty picture of me. Because that ugly picture, I don't, you know, because of my pride, I can't have people knowing that I'm this, this, and that, right? So we utter lies. Your tongue mutters wickedness. I look back at the times that, you know, I'm thinking like in school when I've said, like, talked about somebody behind their back or at work, when you mutter, your tongue is muttered wickedness, right? The things that we say under our breath that nobody else can hear, but God hears. It says, no one enters suit justly. No one goes to law honestly. I know some people that can tell me about this. I know some people that can tell me about going to court and being mistreated, about the system, whatever that is. They rely on empty pleas. They speak lies. They conceive mischief and give birth to iniquity. They hatch adders' eggs. They, they weave the spider's web. He who eats their eggs dies. And from one that is crushed, the viper is hatched. Their webs will not serve as clothing. Men will not cover themselves with what the they make. Their works are works of iniquity. Iniquity is sin. And uh, it says... And deeds of violence are in their hands. Just turn on CNN and see what I'm talking about. Their feet run into evil, and they're swift to shed innocent blood. When I hit that, that verse, I thought about this. I thought, like, I saw an image of, like, a parent with a little toddler, right? And the parent's like, don't, don't go over there. Don't jump into that pool. Don't do it. And then immediately when the, the toddler sees the parent turn away, what does the toddler do? 
jump into the pool. And I think like a lot of us are like that. Like imagine, what do you do when nobody else is looking? Right, when your, your family isn't there and, and no other person is holding you accountable, we, we tend to just dive into sin. It's almost like we're waiting for nobody to be looking. And that, that just reveals our sinful nature, right? And then it says, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Desolation and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their past. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. I thought about the, the verse that says, their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. That is, uh, probably not going to do this this morning. But if I was to take and write down on a sheet of paper, maybe several pieces of paper, all of my thoughts in the last 24 hours, and to read it aloud before the congregation, how embarrassing would that be? If I was to take your thoughts and read it aloud, what's crazy is that sometimes, if for a lot of my life, my, my pride caused me to look at myself and be like, holier than now. Um, thinking that because of my actions or what I say that I'm better than some other person. Or do you guys ever like watch the news sometime and do you see somebody do some crazy thing like they stole from a store or like, you know, like, how can that person ever do that? But if you really think about it, a lot of us have fought those of doing a lot of things that we judge other people for doing, actually, right? And so when we really think about it, our thoughts our sinful nature is inclined toward evil thoughts. And Jesus says in Mark 7 that sin is a heart problem. That it's not just like the outside stuff that I do. And I might judge somebody for stealing from the corner store, but have I coveted? Have I coveted what somebody else has had? Right? Have I coveted somebody else's car, or house, or wife, or husband? In that, in, in, in thinking about that, our thoughts are revealed and our simple nature is revealed. Where did I end up? Do y'all pay attention? Verse 9. Therefore justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold darkness and for brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. I love that verse. It says, among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. This, like, so when I was reading this, I thought about full vigor. I thought about, like, who is, like, the most athletic, awesome, I don't know, celebrity that you've seen? Um, think of, like, LeBron James, right? There's these people in society that we look up to. We're like, man, like, if I could just get to their life, if I could just have what they have. I don't even, and a lot of times, we're not looking for the money and the wealth, but for some reason, like, we feel like, if I just have this person's life, if I have their abilities, you know, if I have their vigor, right? For those of us who are older, look at people who are younger, like me and, like, these people in the world, there's almost this desire to kind of be like them. But the gospel teaches that it doesn't matter how strong you are, how much money you have, like, if you don't have Christ, you're dead. You can't do anything. You're literally spiritually dead. And this is something that, like, we have to teach and proclaim because if we don't proclaim the unworthiness and the deadness and the iniquity of ourselves as a whole and individually, then we, there's no need for Christ. There's no need to be made alive, right? And, and so this is, this is very contrary to what the world is teaching us. So like for kids, every, all the kids look at me real quick. Yeah, that was paying attention. Now you are. So look, what this means is that it doesn't matter whether you get, now you should do good in school, right? I'm not saying you should do good in school, but it doesn't matter if you get all A's and you go to Harvard and you get the best job ever and you're doing a career that you love, that if you do all of that and you don't have a relationship with Christ, you're completely dead spiritually and have no hope. And you don't have any direction. Right? That's something that as parents and as older folks we need to tell our kids. Right? The reason that a lot of us young people don't, like we, we graduate from high school, we graduate from college. I've seen people, I'm a young adult, just got out of college, right? A lot of my friends, they might have a great job, but they don't have any sort of direction. 
A career is not going to give you direction in your life. Only Christ can give your life meaning and direction. All right, I got off track. But the bottom line is, like, think about this. In Ezekiel, um, there's a there's an analogy being used in Ezekiel chapter 16, and it says that that we or Israel in that context was like um, a baby that was cast out and discarded. And the baby was wallowing in her blood, right? Nobody loved this baby. This, this baby was just completely ignored. And that God came through and picked up this baby that was undeserving of anything and made her beautiful and developed her into somebody who was special, right? We are that wallowing baby in our blood. We are that dead person that needs to be raised that we have no power to do anything on our own. That's us, right? I mean, isn't there a show called This Is Us? Right? That's, the, that's us, right? Because of our sin. But the problem is that the, the major hurdle that I see talking to people out here is that we don't really believe that's us. And so we're unable to really need Jesus. All right. Another thing that I thought of is, uh, is the parable of the lost son. Right? What happened was that he had this inheritance and he went away and wanted to party of it all away. Partied it all away and then he was like really in a terrible, desperate situation. He was like eating with the pigs and stuff. And there's a verse in there where he recognizes how, it, how like immobile he is. That he has nothing now and he needs the father. So he runs back to the father and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And then we get to that word worthy. What does worthy mean? I looked this up in the dictionary because it's another one of those words that's kind of like a Bible word. It's like a religious word. Like, what does that actually mean? Like, I say that. I sing worthy is the lamb. What does that actually mean? And it literally just means, like, look it up in Western Dictionary. It means, of oh, worth. Worth a lot. Right? And so he's saying... I'm not worthy to be called your son. And that's that right there is the crossroads. For those of you, like, and for those of you who are not in a relationship with Christ, or for those of you that are, that's the crossroads that every one of us has to hit. The recognition that I am not worthy to be called God's son. Because if I am worthy to be called his son, then what do I need him for? Right? Recognizing that we have no worth apart from Christ. Apart from Jesus, I have no good thing. Apart from God, I have no good thing. And so most people in the world, and the reason I say this is the crossroads, is because most people, like if I was to ask all of y'all right now, raise your hand if you're imperfect. Some of y'all are perfect. I know Jacob and, uh, and yeah, some of y'all back there are, are, are perfect people. We're just not paying attention, right? If you ask anybody at work, go to work tomorrow and ask everybody, are you perfect? Or are you imperfect? Everyone's going to say they're imperfect. The difference is, the difference is, do you think that you are deserving or undeserving of being with God in heaven? And you'll get many different answers on that. Because a lot of us believe that when I get to heaven, matter of fact, when I stand before God, that there's going to be a scale. And there's going to be a scale of the good things I've done and the bad things I've done. And that as long as the good outweighs the bad, then I'm good before God. And that's actually what most religions of the world believe. And a lot of people that find themselves in here on Sunday morning or places throughout the world on Sunday morning in a church building believe that. But what the Bible teaches is that because God is a just God, He cannot be associated with sin. And no matter how much or how little you sin compared to other people, because of our sin, we're all destined for hell. And we are all dead and have no chance of being with God apart from Jesus' sacrifice. And so that's the difference. A lot of people we believe we're imperfect, but not all of us believe that we're undeserving. And when we come to that place, we realize I'm undeserving of Christ. Of my, of my own works, then I need Jesus. And I really need him. Like, like he's worth so much to me. Alright. So let's let's go to uh, Revelation chapter 5. This is the transition. Because I said the cross point, uh, the, 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 what do you, is that called a cross point? 
crossroads, the crossroads is where you realize, Father, I'm no longer worthy to call your son, and I'm running back to the Father. Some of us are before that point, some of us are after that point, but we gotta get through the point to get past the point. All right, Revelation chapter five. This is where we come to the worthiness of God. That means he's worth a lot, because if you really believe that without him you are dead, then he's gonna mean a lot to you if you believe what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross. So Revelation chapter five. It says in verse 1, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back. This is a vision, guys. This is a vision. So John is on this island. He was actually banished to an island because he was talking about Jesus and he truly believed that Jesus raised from the dead. John was one of the dudes who was like close to Jesus. He went with him everywhere. Took care of his mom after he died. And rose again. All right, so he's banished to this island and he's getting this vision from heaven. So there's this scroll in verse 2. It says, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was now worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judy, Judah, the root of David, has conquered, that's Jesus, so that he can open the scroll in his seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing, and as though it had been slain, with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Saints aren't like special Christians, right? The saints are just the people of God, right? Those who are in a covenant relationship with Him. It just means holy people. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy, there's that word, worthy. Are you to take the scroll and to open its seals? For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy, there's that word again, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So just imagine that you are seeing this right now. Like we get up here and we sing songs to God. But imagine if you're among creatures in heaven and angels who are praising God. There's verses in Revelation that they sit praise Him day and night, just saying, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. <laughs> Put yourself in their shoes, right? If you, if you think about the idea of heaven, I think a lot of times, because of the culture we live in, we see heaven as being like, more like stuff. Because we love stuff and luxuries and stuff like that, but a lot of times we think, of, oh man, we're gonna have all we're gonna have these nice cars, I'm gonna have a nice, nice comfy bed out there, and it's gonna be amazing. But uh, I was really challenged with this lately, thinking about, do I love the idea of being with God? Is that why I really look forward to heaven? Because if I love the idea of praising God 24-7 in heaven, why am I not praising Him like that here? Like, you get to do a sneak preview of praising God here while you're here on earth, right? So anyways, that was a tangent. What I really want to look at is, it says, worthy is the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. And so the gospel is that, like I said before, that we are dead in our sins without Christ. That I have no hope. If I have not entered into a covenant relationship with Christ, I have no hope of heaven and no hope of being with God. But God's plan was that because nobody can pay the price for my sins, like one of y'all can't pay the price for my sins, I can't die for yours because I'm not perfect. He sent his only son to come down on earth, live a perfect life, 
life and die on a cross, right? So he was tortured, tortured and murdered at the hands of the Romans and the Jews. And then he was hung on a cross for six hours on a Friday, buried, and then rose up on Sunday morning, right? And he was he appeared to uh, a bunch of people for 40 days and then raised back up into heaven. Which symbolized that he has power over everything. He has power over sin and death. He has power over your, your shame and your guilt. That when I wake up in the morning and I feel kind of weird, like I woke up on the wrong side of the bed, that's really because, it might be because I sinned yesterday and I haven't got open about it and I haven't really confessed and asked for forgiveness. Because each of us sin, we carry that guilt with us. But Jesus said, no way. He came down and he died for that sin and took all of that sin on the cross. He took the punishment that you and I deserve because he is worthy. Right? Because God's love is so great. That's why he did that. And so it's because it says you were slain, that Jesus was slain and his blood paid the price for our sins when it was shed on the cross. And it says he ransomed people. It means he bought us. Right? Who's, who gets bought? Slaves get bought. Right? We were slaves to sin. So we need to be purchased from underneath the control of sin and Satan. Like we looked at in Ephesians 2, we were following Satan. And he's my master. I need to be purchased out of his rule and underneath Christ's rule. That's what he did. And so because of what Jesus did on the cross is why these heavenly creatures are praising him and saying, Worthy. You are worth a lot to me. Matter of fact, you're not just worth a lot to me. You're worth everything to me. And, and for us, when we look at this, how, like, what does it mean in my life that Christ is worth a lot to me? Christ is worth everything to me. And that's where the application goes to. Because if I really believe, if I really believe that I was dead and I needed to be raised, that the situation that I'm in right now, I can't just get out of it myself. Even though that's what everybody at work and everybody in the world is telling me. That I have no hope and no direction without Christ. What he did on the cross, I look at him and say, God, you are worthy. You are, you are amazing. That you're worth more to me now than, let's talk about a couple things. You are worth more to me than my time, right? The gospel, the, the Bible teaches that because of the worthiness and, and, and the amazingness and awesomeness of God and what he did on the cross, and what he did, Jesus said that he died so that we would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised again. So now, Christ is worth more to me than my job. He's worth more to me than my time. I wrote down a couple bullets, right, for us to walk away with. So I want us to just hear this and then just not walk away with anything. I, I did some soul searching and I was like, is Christ really worth that much to me? And how do I really know, how do I know how much Christ is worth to me? Let me ask you this. How much, if I go down to the store, <laughs> no, 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 that's not a good example. All right, anybody have baseball cards when they were growing up? Baseball cards, anybody? Anybody have a really special baseball card? Anybody? What are some, who are some old baseball players? Maybe a big group or something? Who is yours? Phil Fax? Old Fax? See, that's why I say I don't watch baseball, man, but I have baseball cards. Somebody had a Babe Ruth car that was worth a lot. Right? But let me be honest, to me that car ain't worth nothing to me. Right? It's just not worth anything to me. And you know why it's not worth anything to me? One, I don't know about it. <laughs> you just, I, I didn't even know how to say the name go back. Another reason is I wouldn't spend a dime on that baseball card. Right? I wouldn't waste any of my time going to buy that baseball card. I wouldn't waste any of my energy thinking about that baseball card, maintaining it, making sure it doesn't get stolen. Right? I wouldn't put in any of that time, money, or effort into it because it's not worth much to me. So think about this. Each one of you, your life puts a price tag on Christ to you. By your life, you show other people how much God is worth. Right? Because of the amount of time that you give to him. The amount of money. I don't know. Yeah, that, that's true. The amount of money, right? 
what do you do? What do you do with the things that you have? Are you giving it up to God? So we can get an example in Genesis chapter three, I think, right, of Abel and Cain. And God didn't like Cain's offering, but He did like Abel's because Abel gave from the firstborn in his flock. Right? If it doesn't cost you anything, it's not worth anything to you. Right? Worship is meaningless if it doesn't cost me anything. I wrote down here, is Jesus worth my time and my money? Is the mission of Jesus, first of all, what is the mission of Jesus? Second of all, is the mission of Jesus and what he desires for my life, is that costing me anything, costing me any sleep or any time? The Bible says, the second point is, is Jesus worth more than my life? The Bible says that if anyone wants to follow Jesus, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow Jesus. Right? So is Jesus worth more than my dreams and my desires? Maybe I want to go to college, I want to be a, uh, an accountant. I don't know. I don't know, that's not super cool. I want to be a basketball player. You know what I mean? I'm going to start me a business. But think about it. Is Jesus worth more to you than your career goals? Would you be willing to lay those down for Christ? Let's look at a couple more. I want to stay on that. Here's another example. Okay, some of us, we might have uh, kids, right? Might be a parent. I was thinking about this. We all want our young people to grow up and follow Jesus, right? We want Jesus to be worth more to them than basketball, worth more to them than school. We want them to stay going to church, being with the church. But, by our lives, have we shown, have we demonstrated to them that Jesus is more important to me than basketball? Right? Because they might get to that point where they're going out on their own and living life. And we might say, well, I told you about the gospel. I taught you. Right? We might have, I might have got up here and said sermons. You guys might have heard many sermons, but the real, where the rubber meets the road is, have we demonstrated by our lives that Christ is worth more to me than my hobbies, worth more to me than my job. I might want somebody to give up a job or something for Christ, but have they seen that emulated in my life, that Christ is more important to me than my job? I wrote down the workout schedule, because I love to work out. Is Christ worth more to me than working out? And looking in the mirror and, and looking at my figure, such that if, I, if it comes between spending time working out and getting some time with God that I really need to get me through the day, which am I going to choose? Here's, a, here's another one. Is Christ worthy of my devotion and my emotion? Man. So, like, I was at a basketball tournament last week and people were getting real heated, man. It was like some brothers and sisters were at it and some other people that had been invited. And, man, some of the girls were getting, like, super heated and started yelling at the refs. And I was like, dang. And I've totally been there myself. I love basketball, right? And I was thinking, like, have I reserved my emotions, my deepest and strongest emotions for Christ because of what he's done for me? Or is, does that just go to sports, or whatever hobby, whatever job, or, I don't know. What do you get most excited about? It's kind of like if you, if you were married and you got super excited about another woman, and what would your wife think about that? Man, I don't get none of that, right? That would be really terrible, but it's kind of like that with God if I'm in a covenant relationship with Him, and He sees me getting all excited about all these other things that He's created, rather than getting excited about Him who created them and who redeemed me. We see that in the Bible with people like weeping, just coming to tears because of their sin. When's the last time that I've really been broken and weeping because of how I've sinned against God? Right? Is he worth more to me than any other? Think about any sin in your life right now. And what that practically looks like is, if you have to choose between this sin and God, what do you practically choose on a daily basis? How much do you really want to rid your, that sin from your life? Because the Bible says we've got to throw off 
any sin and anything that easily entangles us? Are we throwing off the stuff that's keeping us from getting to God? Like, you know, I always use the example of relationships, right? You see somebody, like a guy who's about to propose to a girl that he's like really in love with, he might be the most introverted dude ever, but he's gonna like climb mountains to fight for this girl, right? We, we fight for what's worth a lot to us. All right, I got just two or three more. Worth more than anybody else. The Bible says that anyone who loves father or mother or son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Right? It means like Jesus is saying, man, if y'all love each other more than you love me, you're not worth my time. Right? You're not worth my time today. And what he's really saying there is that Christ, because of what he done, deserves our devotion and our love, far above anything anybody any, anything we give to anybody else. So that's my spouse, that's my best friend, that's my son or daughter, my father or mother. The way this plays out is when you have to choose between a relationship, all right, let's talk about people who are not married, right? If I'm a single guy and I have to choose between pursuing a relationship with somebody who's not gonna bring me closer to Christ and help me in my relationship with God, right? And just pursuing God, what do I actually choose? It's a lot, you can talk about seeing Christ as worthy, but when it really comes down to the obedience of that, it's, it's a lot harder to, to, to discern and to actually follow through. So is Christ worth more to you than any other relationship in your life? Because Jesus says that if that's true, even if you, even if your own dreams and goals and your own pursuits are worth more to you than Christ in his life, you're not worthy of me. Because you don't appreciate, he's saying that, that if that's the case, then I don't really appreciate what Christ has done for me. I, I really must not get it. Alright? And that's where I want to end at right now. Is that if you feel like you're in a place where Christ is not worth a lot to you, you are in a covenant relationship with Christ. Right? That you said, I want to follow Jesus. I'm in for, like, I'm in for the long haul. I'm not just here. I didn't just make a decision. Like, I got an emotional state and I just felt like I want to start going to church more. No, that I'm in a covenant relationship with Christ, that I want to pursue Him. If you feel like you're in a spot where He's not worth enough to you, right, that it's like, I need Christ and something else. I need Christ and a good job, and a great church, and good circumstances. If He's not enough, then we got to return to the gospel and remember where we were, that we were dead. Without him, we have no mobility at all. Right? we got to return to that. we got to hit that crossroads again. God, like, I'm not deserving of what I have. And really return to the gospel because that's what motivates us. And for those of us who are not in Christ, who are not to a covenant relationship with God, we got to... And this is, we are all in this together, right? we got to continue to teach each other and really wrestle with the gospel. Wrestle, do I really believe what I'm saying here, right? Is this, is this real for me? Or is this just up here? It's got to answer the heart. Do I really want to put Christ, because of what he's done, above everything else in my life? And do I want to begin my journey of pursuing his worthiness and praising him with everything that I do? Because the closer, when you are ready to make that decision, right, to give up everything inside, I want to, I want to make Him all of my work. Then you are ready to start this journey, right? And we all got to reevaluate ourselves if that's where we're at. And then when you get to that point, right, when you get to that point, that's not where I really want to pursue that. That's when we come before and we acknowledge to God our sin and our unworthiness before Him. And say, God, I want to give my life to you and change my ways. I want to, I want to start living for you. And I want to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins and raised so I can start living a new life, clean from sin, and in a relationship with God. And it's only by His Spirit, it's only by His Spirit that He gives us that we're able to walk this walk. So I want to, I want to just say a prayer for us real quick, and we're going to close out. But just think about this. Think about this. How much is Christ worth to you? Because when I look at the Bible and relive what Jesus Christ has done for me, I can't help but be more in awe 
of how amazing he is and ashamed of the ways of my daily life, which I lower his value to me and show to other people around me that he's not worth as much as X, Y, and Z. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for giving us